Hello and welcome everyone to our next installment of our podcast uh, on Making Connections, a handbook for effective mentoring, uh, effective formal mentoring programs in academia. I'm very excited to be here today with our authors from chapter 16, which is one of our case studies. So this is going to be a really great opportunity today uh, to meet with folks who have talked about, pro who have uh, done quite a bit of work uh, with programs on the ground and have gone in depth uh, and can provide us um, with some firsthand experience and expertise uh, on building out a program. Uh, I am here today uh, with Tim Schroeder, Tara Hackle, and Yade Sawyer, who have all contributed uh, to this case study and to this really important mentoring work that they have done uh, at the University of New Mexico. Tim is the Director of Undergraduate Research, Art and Design Network at the University of New Mexico and has focused primarily on developing programming to better serve marginalized student populations. Uh, and to shift institutional culture and practices uh, to become more inclusive and equitable. I think that's going to be a common thread with these authors that I'm excited to, to dive into. Uh, Tara has served in uh, academic and student support roles um, within a diverse Research One university for over 10 years um, and has now brought that experience to the University of New Mexico, where uh, Tara focuses on optimizing well-being for learners who are historically excluded from the full rights, privileges, and opportunities of formal education. Um, and Tara is uh, currently working on projects uh, to optimize schooling experiences for LGBTQ plus teens uh, and gender diverse students. Yade has a long-standing commitment to mentoring and is a research assistant uh, for the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program in the Biology Department at the University of New Mexico and has been working with UNM staff with a continued focus on increasing success in STEM. So I am very excited to have this conversation. I think there is a, a real common thread in your care uh, and passion for um, students who have been ex historically excluded for equity and inclusion in this case study. Your example really speaks to that. So Tim, can you start by telling us what has inspired uh, your work and research in mentoring and particularly the work uh, uh, you all have done in this collaboration with uh, the work that you have done with STEM students at UNM? Yeah, this, is, this has been a really exciting program. It started as a grant funded by the U.S. Department of Education focused on um, co-curricular STEM engagement uh, for students, especially students who have been traditionally marginalized in STEM fields. And when we set out to uh, propose this program and then to run this program, we really wanted to focus on first and second year students uh, because at universities like ours, that's where uh, retention and persistence um, tend to become uh, uh, disproportionately problematic where the institution uh, tends to screen out students that um, we most really want us to see succeed. So uh, we were aiming at uh, specifically first generation, uh, low income students, uh, students who had very little exposure to research or STEM professions. And the grant itself had a number of different elements, um, including summer experiences and um, we we went to uh, one of the national labs here in Albuquerque, and we said we would we would love to really build an exciting program with you. What what are you really interested in? And they really came back with mentoring. Um, we were actually looking at another model at the time, uh, but that was the the area they felt that they they could really uh, provide support and really fit their needs of diversifying uh, the workforce at the lab. So um, we, we took that up as a challenge and we really wanted to build a mentoring program that was um, low entry barriers, low time commitments, because the students that we wanted to engage 
uh, were working often full time in addition to being full time students uh, and did not have huge time commitments. They came from schools that were often rural and in many cases underfunded, and so they they may not have had the uh, co curricular or even the curricular experiences that you know kind of place them front and center in highly competitive programs. And so we wanted to create an on ramp, a way of uh, structuring and scaffolding students into those more competitive programs. And we felt like this type of a mentoring program where you know, there really wasn't a competitive entry portal, where there wasn't a huge time commitment, where it was not, um, you know, students weren't expected to come in with a vast amount of previous experience or knowledge. Uh, and we really wanted that population to engage with the scientists uh, because there was such an enormous potential for them to make, you know, in, you know, gains very quickly uh, and to be able to become more competitive with students whose parents were college professors, you know, and, and who often rise to the top in competitive internships and um, co-curricular engagements in STEM and research. Yeah, thanks for that background, Tim, because I, I think one of the things that we know, right, is, is uh, advancement academically and professionally is about relationships, right, and, and the folks that we know. But I, I and I want to uh, drill down a little bit and talk a little more about that partnership, because I, I it was one of the things I found very interesting about your case study uh, is how much the program evolved through conversation and collaboration with the labs. And so can you talk a little bit about um, what those conversations were like, what goes into that conversation, and, and how much of what you all built uh, was really grounded in um, creating and cultivating those relationships and partnerships? Sure. Tara, you were, you were pretty much on the ground floor in those conversations. You want to take that one? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, thanks for having us on the podcast. Excited to be here. So uh, the Tim mentioned that we originally had a different idea, which was sort of going to local scientists and engineers to get them to sign on to do projects with our students. And when they came back with um, mentoring, we were like, well, why not? We can at least pilot something and see how it goes. And we originally started meeting with the women's resource group at Air Force Research Labs. And I would say these employee resource groups, I think we mentioned them in the chapter, became a very important place for us to recruit, especially when we're talking about like cultural, cultural identity and finding folks that sort of align with our students' backgrounds so that they have this cultural connection. And so through the women's resource group, that's who originally talked about if we want to address gender issues in STEM, we need to have we need to start connecting our women scientists and engineers with your women students. And a lot of it too was the folks in those employee resource groups were managers and were um, taking summer interns. And they were saying to us, you know, your UNM students just aren't well represented here in our summer internship pool, they're just not competing. And we'll, we saw that as an advantage. We can physically connect our students with these people who are then hiring and it worked. You know, our students came in and received mentors over time and then eventually started competing for internships and then eventually got hired. You know, some of our greatest success stories are the students who came in as mentees and who graduated and became employees of these organizations. Um, and so I'm struggling to remember what your question even was because I'm so excited to be here and talking about the program, but I think it was something around like how did this relationship with the labs sort of start and how were they included in the program and the the very original semester was meeting with the mentors from the organization and making hand selected matches for the first eight that joined the program, which quickly became unsustainable we couldn't you know, we, we eventually grew to 60 matches. You can't just get 60 folks in a room and have them pick their students. And so we had to develop more streamlined processes for matches. But those mentors at Air Force Research Labs were heavily involved in designing the program, coming up with what would work for the, the mentors because their organization also similar to the students, they're not always there for long periods of time. Those employees get sort of moved all around the country. And so they too benefited from having a semester commitment instead of a years long commitment. 
And so really like when I was kind of prepping for this podcast and thinking about like what was most important, a lot of it was in the early years, like listening to what people said they could do and what they needed. And even the ways we eventually started matching around like, you want a mentor who speaks Spanish, you want a mentor who's a parent, you want a mentor who is also gay. Like those came through conversations with students saying, you know, what's most important to me. I don't care if they're an optical engineer like me, I want them to be a parent. And so we were able to make these matches that I think a lot of other programs might overlook because they didn't align in research or didn't align in major, but they aligned culturally. And it was through that cultural alignment that they stayed engaged with one another and kept returning to the program. And then we're able to get introductions to folks that were maybe more aligned with their actual like career, but it was sort of the cultural relationship that came first to keep them engaged. And one of the other things that I think is really important for the first and second year students that Tim is talking about is, you know, I, I'm a first gen student too. Like I knew one engineer and that was my mom. And that's why I became an engineer and she was an engineer before she needed a degree. And so just like a very different kind of engineer than a lot of others. And for a lot of our first gen students, they only know their professors and each other. And so if you can introduce them to another scientist or engineer, well, now they have a connection. And especially if they're aligning culturally, now they can see themselves in that role. We know that especially students of color benefit most from mentors who look like them. And so getting getting folks to build relationships through those employee resource groups where we're recruiting um, engineers of color or gay engineers or women engineers, like that let us put students into relationships with folks that they could see themselves as, um, which was super important for this this group of of students. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because as I've been reading through the, the book and talking with authors, there's some earlier chapters before folks get to chapter 16 that talk about some of those early processes, things to do in place. And I think what you just expressed, Tara, is such an excellent example of listening, right? Listening to uh, your student population, right? Listening to to those of whom you are trying to serve and listening to your partners and and having the humility to, to take in that information and deviate from the original plan. Sometimes we can start out with a plan and get so stuck in our plan that we end up not listening. And I think uh, that on top of taking into account folks' cultural background, their cultural needs and identity are so key. To me, as I was reading through this project, it just reflected such high levels of cultural competence that I think are so necessary, uh, both in the planning and implementation of a, a, a mentoring, a program and mentoring relationships. And as we hit hiccups, for example, like one of the things that came up for working with the national laboratories was around citizenship. And just internally in the office, I didn't, I didn't feel like I had the knowledge to really address how do we integrate students who aren't U.S. citizens but are clearly here and would benefit from a mentoring program where if they disclose that to their mentor, it has to be reported to the security department. It's like, well, that's unacceptable. So how do we encourage folks who aren't U.S. citizens to apply without scaring them? And that meant collaborating with El Centro de la Raza, our student organization or student office on campus, student serving office on campus that had that knowledge and expertise. So you mentioned humility. This was definitely a lesson in humility and also just recognizing the mentors were asking for something and the mentees were asking for something. And if I just give that to them, like if I'm the admin who just makes that happen, then they're going to keep coming back, which is exactly what happened. It was more about like me getting out of the way and using the power that I had on campus and the resources I had on campus and the money we had through the grant to support this when really it was just giving them the things that they asked for and kind of yeah. getting getting out of the way. And I know Yade has really taken what I helped to build and streamlined the communication and the check-ins with students over time, which wasn't something that I focused a lot on, but I know she has. Yeah, Yade, can you talk about that? Because that was the other, the next question I was going to ask about uh, the accessibility of this program for students and the efforts that have gone into ensuring access um, and, 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 and being able to sustain this program over time uh, is so important. So can you share your experience around uh, those things? Sure. So there's been, so the program itself started in 2015 and was grant supported. I came on board once Tara had left the position, but the grant was still around. 
<clears throat> and it served all of campus. And so as Tim was looking where it could be institutionalized, the director, the new director of the Engineering Student Success Center here at UNM reached out and said, I'm interested in taking it on and I'm willing to keep it open to all STEM majors. Um, as much as we, Tara was very much emphasizing the engineer component, the program was, is the STEM mentoring program and is open to STEM majors. However, because of the types of contacts that we have, and the traction and conversations that we've had, most of it focused on most of the opportunities and accessibility were for the engineering students with some computer science and then some dabbling in some of the other majors. When I came on board with the STEM Collaborative Center, I used some of my connections as a biology PhD to try to bring in some biology folks and was able to get some of them, but even the students that seem to participate and take advantage of the opportunities were highly School of Engineering students. To make it accessible to everybody, there's, there were a couple different ways that Tara initially ran it and then kind of what I've then taken on with how do you market it and how do you connect to those students? And then when, how do you, what do you require them to do to get into the program? Because as Tim said, we wanted it to be easy access, but you also can't just say you're here, you're free. There has to be some kind of foundation. And so we ran it, the students now, the way that I run it is it's an initial priority matching. They complete an interest form. I have a priority deadline. They're required to select one of some pre-scheduled orientation sessions where we cover basic con content of reinforcing that it's a very student-driven program, that they need to be flexible with what they're working with with their mentor, the keys to effective communication, and how to really maximize what they're getting out of the relationship. Because a lot of the students and people in general don't effectively communicate their needs. They don't advocate for themselves. And so making sure that it was clear and actually good for them to do that is something that we cover in that orientation so that they're setting a good solid foundation. And it decreases some of the intimidation of now entering into a relationship with a professional in that field. Um, in that orientation, I also cover what goals do you want to work on? And we kind of brainstorm some of the possible goals because it's a very informal relationship. We encourage them to read to meet one hour a week in some live fashion, but what how much it really happens, we're not having them fill anything out because we're not paying them for this. They're getting out of it what they put into it. And so we encourage them to do something, but to help give them guidance on topics. That's why we do that brainstorming. And then to really make content accessible because students. They're like, oh, a mentor. Okay, that sounds like something I should probably do. And then they have no idea what to do with them. And then unless that's why I implemented then the regular check-ins as well, because they don't initiate reaching out saying, I haven't connected with my mentor or I, we met, but we ran out of things to say. And so making sure that I have regular contact and check-in with them has been one of the key components to making sure that they are moving forward and progressing and just doing those so I just, I send a check-in shortly after I make the initial matches. I send a check-in mid-semester and then one at the end of semester to see what their plans are, if they're wanting to stay partnered together, if they wanna mix it up and stay in the program or if they decided that they got out of it what they intended initially. Um, it's very important that for the, the access component as Tara and Tim kind of touched upon, Luckily, as we've broadened the company base because of partnering now, being within the School of Engineering, we now have access to more companies through our job and internship coordinators connections as well. And so we're able to provide support for a lot of additional non-citizen students. Like we don't have that caveat. Um, I also make it, it makes, as I market, I push it that there are no GPA requirements to be in this program. That I don't believe in GPAs until at least your junior year at a university. Like, no, I'm not gonna look at them so that they know that they can find that passion and really make it accessible to them that way. Um, and we have the initial matching. I do the priority matching. And then if I have mentors left, then I'll do a bit more targeted emails to try to get students to join. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, 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 one of the things that I found so fascinating that I think for those of us who are live in New Mexico, um, 
uh, that that juxtaposition of, of who our students are and the barriers that students across the state face and experience um, juxtaposed against having so many of these labs also in our state. And, and, and what I find so incredible is how you all really found that leverage point and have utilized it to have such an impact for students and creating that access because, you know, high potential talent in an organization, high performing students typically already have uh, mentors and relationships that are going to help them advance. So honing in on that and leveraging that juxtaposition, um, I, I, I just um, saw it as such a astute recognition of needs and, uh, and opportunities. And I, I think too, that there's a certain reliance in these kind of opportunities nationwide on artificial predictors of success. Um, GPA is is really bad at that because, um, you know, it, all it takes is one bad semester and then you spend years trying to get your GPA back up. It's it's it is it, it rarely has a fix for a rough gig. And so it doesn't it doesn't really predict standardized scores awful at predicting success in college, certainly, um, you know, not great at predicting professional success. Um, Essays, you know, um, tend to be uh, well written by people who have really good editors at their disposal. Um, you know, so I mean, there are a lot of these kind of things that programs really rely on, and they use them as predictors of a student's readiness to engage, a student's ability to engage, a student's ability to contribute, and then go on to succeed. And I don't think they are. Um, I think uh, there's so much more to a student than than these kind of artificial measures. And I think a program like this allows students to build their repertoire, their portfolio, so that they have more of an ability to compete and to and to converse and to to use the the same language as as you know again, kids of professors and and um, really really take advantage of those more competitive programs later. And I think slide into the the realm of those connections that already came up where, yeah, let's say this first year student is applying for an internship at AFRL and maybe they don't have the best resume, but now their mentor knows that person who's on the hiring committee can say, no, like I've known this person for a year. They're a really good fit. Let's give them a shot. And I think about my first engineering internship. That's how that happened is they were like, we have a person vouching for this person who on paper doesn't look great. And then I was able to show up and show my work ethic and show them that they made the right choice. And that's a lot of what our students need is like, just give me a shot. You're ruling me out by my GPA before I even get in the door. And I think just related to the other point that you were making tomorrow is like, our, a lot of our New Mexican students want to stay here. There's a family connection. They don't want to have to go somewhere else to work. And so making sure they're building these connections for after graduation, they can leave because they've now got these incredible experiences if they want to. But if they want to stay to be close to family, which is what we hear over and over from our students, they now have these potentials to get jobs, these competitive, high paying jobs here locally and stay connected to family where we think they'll be more successful because they're not being divorced from their family connections to go get a job within their field. And I would say like, we're, you know, we're kind of hinting at like industry and internship, but it's also graduate school. Folks needs let folks need references and letter of recommendations, no matter what they do after undergrad, whether it's a job or whether it's grad school. And I usually say that to them around like, why are you in this mentoring program? Because at any moment you want to apply for a job and you're going to need at least one reference. And this person, should you choose to invest in the relationship, might be that for you. And if you stay connected with them for a year or two years, now they can put it that they've known you for two years and they've seen you grow. And so like, these are really wonderful relationships, but I wanted to add related to serving first gen, low income students of color is like, I was as a white person, I was taught to negotiate with authority. I'm used to negotiating with white authority. That's who I grew up around all of my family, all of my teachers, but some folks need to learn the strategies to negotiate with their professors or to, um, advocate for themselves. That's already come up. And so a lot of what I did in orientation, and I'm assuming Yade goes there too, is you deserve to be here 
you deserve a mentor. This mentor has only gotten to where they are because they had mentors and now they want to give back. You are not asking for anything astronomical by needing anything from them. They needed somebody too. Like you are just tapping into the culture here. You're not asking too much. You're not a burden. You deserve this. Someone should look at your resume and help you get an internship because everybody who's ever had an internship or a job has had somebody help them with their resume. And so like you are just tapping into that and sort of like convincing them that they deserve this. Like they're not yeah. asking for too much. And that's a lot of what I do with those first year students. And then hoping that those skills translate into the classroom where they can then negotiate with faculty or TAs around grades or syllabi or assignments. So we talk, I explicitly talked about negotiating with authority in orientation. Yeah. It's a real cultural, uh, 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 well, on one part, it's a cultural shift in terms of how you structure this mentoring program. And when thinking about accessibility, thinking about who has access and who don't, who doesn't, and who we want to create access for, identifying those barriers to entry and removing them. And I think that's so well articulated by uh, you all here today and as well as in your chapter. Uh, and also recognizing, Tara, to, to the point you were just making is that, um, you know, the dominant culture that we have in business and industry in the U.S. context not everybody has access to till till they're in it, right? Um, and I think what you're speaking to, that is something I am particularly passionate about in my work and working in uh, with corporations around mentoring is the role of the mentor beyond mentoring, but the role of the mentor as an ally and as an advocate and as a sponsor. Um, and so and one of the questions I have is, so in your conversations with mentors and your training with mentors, do you talk with them about advocacy and sponsorship? Yeah, they are muted. Yeah, I, I realized that. I, like I clicked it and it just didn't unclick. Uh, <laughs> um, as the program currently stands, there is some guidance towards the mentors, but I don't do an extreme amount of mentor training. I do have a handbook that Tara initially put together that I've then updated and modified. Um, and we give to the mentors that they can look through if they want some guidance. It includes things like how to have an effective conversation, how to move from just chit chat into that deeper stuff. What are some example questions that they can ask? Um, resources that they have access to reminding them that we're here to help for them or help them but we don't have any formal required training for the mentors to go through i do have the regular check-ins not just with the students but also for the mentors so that they can know i'm, I'm actually here like yeah. I'm, I'm not just a person connecting you to a student like i have knowledge that can help guide you when you get some of those I don't know what to do to help the student. And so that's why it's so important to have those regular check-ins, especially with the way that the program currently stands, because we don't have a formalized requirement for the mentors of things that they have to accomplish or prove that you are an effective mentor, because the student right. feedback can do that, right? Um, or the student saying, I want to stick with them and they're great, kind of weeds itself out. Um, and so it's mainly doing it just through being there for the conversation as they need support. And like Tara, before I lose tr track of my thoughts. So if I didn't answer it, Tara. I think, you well, you got me to a place where I have stuff to add. So that's good. Um, I think like one of the things that really struck me when putting together these interest forms for students and mentors is we started rolling out um, like gender and race questions and identity questions. And I was, we made them optional. And I noticed that a lot of the mentors were leaving them blank. And when I was getting together with them to start making matches, they were saying, you know, these identity questions just aren't relevant to this mentoring relationship. And so a lot of the advocacy work came on our end, explaining to them that these are relevant and the students are asking for mentors who understand their cultural identities. And you can either... To, like choose to invest in being able to mentor folks who are different from you, or you're gonna have a much smaller population of students that you're able to mentor and you wanna be here. So wh which one do you wanna choose? And so I think that 
maybe we weren't necessarily providing the guidance around mentoring folks that are different from you, that's a direction we could go. But hopefully through the way we did our forms and the way we explained why we ask about your identity, because that's how I addressed it was people are leaving this blank and I need them not to, but I, on principle, I don't want to require it. And so just more adding an explanation of why I'm asking you for your race and why I'm asking you for your gender. And what I'm looking for in this write-in section around explaining your background, because my students are asking for this information about you. So that sort of came into play with matching. And then also yeah. just going back to employee resource groups. These are folks who are taking advantage of paid time to engage with folks that are like them at work around bettering the culture. Yeah. And so by recruiting from employee resource groups, which um, I, th I th like there's at Sandia alone, Sandia National Labs, they have like ethnicity and race-based groups for everyone. Um, and I've continued to stay engaged with their women's resource group and continue to stay engaged through, I advise the Out in STEM student org through their like LGBTQ resource group. And so when we had students asking for mentors from these backgrounds, having relationships with folks in those ERGs, those employee resource groups, we could go to them and say, I'm sure to mentor for this person who's asking for this. And then they would go to a meeting and say, we have a student at UNM that's looking for a mentor. And so that could help bring folks into the program. Yeah. And then similarly, you know, um, we would have students who would request like a sociology mentor. And you're like, we don't have sociology mentors at Air Force Research Labs and Sandia <laughs> National Labs. Maybe we do, maybe we can ask. But a lot of times those became, the mentors were grad students. I'd go to the grad departments and find folks in the grad programs who could mentor those students. And then those connections could lead to more sort of like industry or employment connections. So I'm, I'm sure Yade, you still do this, but it was like, no students turned away. So Yade mentioned like, I don't look at your GPA. I was like, if you tell me you want a mentor, I'm gonna go get you a mentor. It might take me a couple months to find somebody, but I'm gonna find somebody and then you're gonna have someone next semester. And so just like really conveying to the students, like this is for you, I'm, I'm gonna go find you somebody. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I, I uh, you brought up a point, I don't wanna lose it, but I don't wanna miss, the, the how uh, identity is important, right? It's uh, important in matching because we know from the research that uh, cross-cultural mentoring um, can suffer without the level of cultural competence on the part of the mentor. And so that is such a key component in cross-cultural mentoring relationships. And I know in your particular program, these are pretty short relationships. Um, and, and so for folks to be able to hit the ground running where there is some built in trust and confidence, which comes when we, you know, have a mentor who's like me, whatever like me is for you, that those same identity mentoring relationships kind of have that added uh, bonus of that trust first, they can certainly happen effectively cross-cultural, but folks really have to have that competence and awareness, self-awareness of where their own identity could get tripped up in trying to build trust with somebody whose experience is different from their own. And so I, I think y'all being so intentional and thoughtful about that, uh, particularly for folks who are listening uh, and read the chapter who want to see um, who are building mentoring programs to address DE and I challenges? Um, having that uh, understanding is really important. Tim? Yeah, I think I think those kind of those aligned relationships are also um, possibly more important at the entry level, at the freshman and sophomore level, and they're more important for first generation students who may have had very little access to in this case stem professionals um, who may not have seen themselves in other in stem professionals because they just they just don't, they don't their families don't run in those circles um, and so if they're coming in with a voice in the back of their head that's saying you know you may not be really this this kind of you may not be engineer material you know like what's going to feed that voice and what's going to turn that voice away and um, finding mentors who are uh, aligned with that identity, who can say, "Yeah, I, I hear you. I see you. I, I get what you're what you're coming in with. Those strengths, those values that you bring as part of your identity, are going to help you as an engineer. And we need more people like you 
as engineers and scientists in this in this place and hearing that you know pushes that voice up kind of the back right it, it pushes that that voice down um but you know it, and it, but you know i think that those kind of cross-cultural mentorships like they, they work great in other capacities they you know for students who are are very well prepared and they're they're maybe connecting to a mentor um you know as a senior or in a grad level um you know and and they're you know their their voices they don't have that voice and so uh, maybe they've already pushed it down or uh you know they they've just never been told by teachers that you can't do this or um, administrators so they don't have that nagging voice so um, i think there is a place and a context for that kind of cross cross-cultural yeah, totally. uh, mentoring but i think a place where this really matters is for entry level students and students who may never have thought of themselves or have actually actively been told that they are not this kind of material. Mm. Yeah, thanks for that, Tim. Which All again right. goes back to what we what we need to do in higher education is is not expect students to do something different, but change the way that we do things. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we need to be very very actively working on is what is our messaging to students and what are we saying that we don't even hear ourselves saying yeah yeah so key so key thank you for that tim i wanted to expand on what tim was saying about cross-cultural mentoring relationships because i don't want to give the impression that like everybody was so perfectly aligned that everybody just looked like little twins and minimi mini me is like running around like that's absolutely not what we achieved and that wasn't the goal because we know that certain groups have more access to power and if we only align people with people who are like them then we're not going to change who's in power and so those cross-cultural relationships are extremely important and I think what Tim is saying like is relevant like the tender first year who needs a gentler touch, like we're going to be a little more intentional and let them build up skills before we sort of throw them into like a, a culture that might be more antagonistic. But I would say one of the things that I'm thinking about now as we're talking about this in relationship to gender, I was like, we had a lot of uh, mentors who are men paired up with mentees who are women. And we can talk about how, all the different layers around why that was successful. But one of the biggest champions of the program from the mentor perspective was one of the high level managers at AFRL. And she just encouraged everybody she supervised to be a mentor. And so you had this female leader recommending to everybody to do this program. And so a lot of the men that we recruited into the program had female leadership. And so I think they they brought a respect to mm -hmm. this program for women um, that we really benefited from and the students in our program really benefited from. Yeah, yeah, that's that cultural confidence piece, right? And to the point that you made, Tim, sometimes uh, we say things and <laughs> we don't understand the impact of what we say, good or bad. Um, and if, you know, uh, things have been status quo or things seem to be, um, you know, the norm for us, it can seem hard to believe that that's not the norm for another person. And sometimes in that curiosity or uncertainty, things can be said that end up, you know, as you said, kind of creating those nagging voices. And so it really is a learning journey, particularly for institutions and complex, in, complex institutions like higher ed. More to become more self-aware of how are we unintentionally uh, sending messages that are counter to to what we're really trying to to accomplish and fostering these really um, full and rich learning experiences uh, for students. I mean, one it. thing we can do that I encourage the mentors to do, though, to help with when you do have these cross-cultural partnerships, or if someone is putting their foot in their mouth or whatever, is one of the best ways to build on that is really just to follow your curiosity. And so when you have those differences, instead of saying, these are these differences that are creating barriers to us understanding each other, just ask questions about it to truly enhance what your exposure and understanding and compassion. And eventually, if you continue to follow your curiosity and ask follow-up questions, the person can see that you're genuinely there to support them and 
even if you say something that's culturally insensitive, they might not take it as roughly because they've seen the path that it's taken to get there or what you're willing to do moving forward to truly understand where they're coming from. And so I think that is that is definitely a key component within that handbook. And as I email the matches, I have a very explicit statement of, here's how you can even start this relationship by just following that curiosity pathway forward. So yeah, that's phenomenal, right? Practicing curiosity is such a key component of, of uh, that cultural awareness and the cultural competence and having effective mentoring relationships, um, whether they're, uh, you know, across culture, across gender, uh, uh, or aligned, right? It's really key. One of the other aspects of your uh, chapter that I noted um, that speaks to what was mentioned earlier as we turn no mentees away is that this started as a traditional one-to-one -one mentoring program, but that you've also built in some peer mentoring. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the peer mentoring. So the peer mentoring initially started with Tara, when it was with Tara, and it was a way to allow the students who established a good relationship with their mentors to then shift into more of that leadership guider inter guiding interface. And so to shift into the mentor role. Since I've taken over the program, that particular transition has taken a back seat, not because there's not value to it, because it absolutely has value, but it's because I also started a peer mentoring program. So it just muddied the waters a little too much since the students were like, wait, co-mentoring here or peer mentoring there. It was like, I'm not going to try to, to run that many lines of things. Um, but the way that it would work is if a student and a mentor had worked together for at least a semester and they felt that the student had grown enough and the student had enough of a desire to take on more of the guiding what angle of it being more of the mentor, then the mentor felt like they could support that transition. The two of them would act as a pair together to mentor a new incoming match. Wow, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, I am so impressed with the work that you all have done. I, I can say that I'm excited that this is happening locally in my community. Um, and uh, I think folks are going to really enjoy reading through your case study. Um, but before we go, I want to ask you, because, you know, folks who are reading the book and listening are folks who are either have just been asked <laughs> to implement a mentoring program or are thinking about it or are halfway or have done it and have had some level of success or not. And so from your experience and what you've learned, I'd love for you to share with us um, for these folks, for program coordinators, for your peers, whether they're in higher ed or, or at another organization, when implementing a mentoring program, what is something you believe is a must have? Being okay, being uncomfortable. No, I'm serious because there are so many situations that arise, whether it's reaching out for potential mentors or reaching out to leadership to try to support it or to get funding or all these other things or conversations that might come up in there in each of the mentoring relationships. And it's not just being okay, being uncomfortable, but actively seeking it because it's when you're uncomfortable, you know, you're actually making the biggest difference. So I know that that's kind of a weird of a must have. <laughs> But I would say that that's one of them. I, I would say a must have is a clear connection between who you want to serve and how you're going to structure the program. Um, if, you, if you come in and you say, well, in order to be credible, our program has to have really high academic standards and, and yeah, we're trying to serve first generation uh, freshmen and we're going to have these really, you know, um, massive essay requirements and 10 letters of recommendation and we're going to look at their standardized scores and, and because that's what makes it an official mentoring program and that's that's how we're going to become credible yeah I don't, I don't i don't buy that i think there has to be a really clear connection between who you want to serve and what's the best structure of a mentoring program that is going to get them in the door and and help them be successful in those connections 
My must have is evaluation. And I think uh, the more granular and regular at the start, and then as you become more confident that you're doing what you think you're doing, then the collection be can become less or like more survey based. When we first started, there was a lot of coffee conversations, a lot of let's meet over at the coffee shop and talk about how this is going for you. What feedback do you have? I'm never ashamed to put the interest form in front of, in front of somebody and say, critique this out loud, like fill this out and talk to me while you fill it out. So I can find the areas where they're bumping or confused. And like I throughout this podcast talked about conversations, like things that really changed the trajectory of the program that just came up in conversation. At the end of each semester, we had these sort of like mixer events where we invite invited everybody to come hang out and just being sure that you're there and going around and having conversations and saying, how is the program for you? Like if you could change anything about it, what would it be? And letting those, that kind of feedback drive, especially early in the program around what you're doing, but then to not lose sight of like iterative and consistent evaluation over time where this is like an unprecedented way, like time where people are changing the way they relate to school and the way to work. And if Yade just kept running the same program, we would become irrelevant. And we have like new generations entering universities at all, all the time. And so I think continue, like don't drop off your evaluation just because you think you're good. Like make sure you're continuing to touch base in some regularity with how it's going for your people and get ahead of it. If you notice a major drop off, in applicants one semester, like try to find out why so that it doesn't become a problem over many years that now you have a harder, harder time addressing. Yeah, I love that evaluation, be willing to be uncomfortable and have those uncomfortable conversations and really having that alignment with uh, who you're trying to serve and how you're structuring the program. I think those are, are such incredible must-haves. What would you say is a nice to have? I'm, you know, given that I got the must-haves in place, what would be a nice to have? Money. <laughs> <laughs> because like is you need some, yes, you need the baseline money of us someone to run the program. Beyond that, it definitely is nice to have funds for mixers, for coffee hours, for all these other things, potentially even stipends for the participants or thank yous to the mentors, which at no point in either iterations of the program have we been able to do that one. Um, so having funds for those things is nice yeah. because it allows you to motivate and recognize participants a lot more, but it's not critical to the functioning process. Great. Yeah, I'm gonna steal your days and say money is nice to have for sure. Um, cause in addition to like mixers, you know, talking about like how we honored some of our mentors is we had a wonderful, amazing local artist as our like in-house graphic designer on this grant. We were so fortunate to have John Sanchez and he just designed these like beautiful hand screen printed posters to give to the mentors. And if you Google our program, you'll find the articles from Air Force Research Labs of the mentors proudly holding up these beautiful pieces of art. I think all of us have a copy of his posters framed. So there's ways with like low, low money to do small things that mean a lot. Um, similarly, we like gave awards to the students and like, don't tell anybody at UNM, but I made the award up. Like it, I just <laughs> made it up and gave it to students. And so there's things you can do without money to recognize yeah. people. But also one of the things that hasn't come up yet is like money for field trips. This group sort of became a cohort. And so we were able to take them to Air Force Research Labs for a field trip or to Sandia for a field trip. And you need bus money and you need lunch money. And so money is nice. You can do a lot without it, but it certainly helps. Yeah. Tim, are you going to triple down on money? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to jump down and go in the same direction. I think the 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 more resources you have, the more students you can serve. Um, one of the fun things about those posters was we would put our websites uh, uh, on the poster, and then we would we would hang these beautiful posters around campus, and we would hope that people would steal them because they'd end up in dorm rooms. And if we tried to put them in dorm rooms, they'd never go in. But uh, right. if people saw really cool posters and they took them down and put them in their dorm room, we would just replace the poster and then we'd have free advertising. So um, I think there are a lot of creative ways that that um, you can kind of overcome uh, a lack of funding, uh, but certainly with, with a wise use of funding, you can do even more. Yeah, yeah, those are phenomenal ideas. All right, so what can we live without? What can we live without? Glitz and glamour. 
So use the money intentionally for reason, like recognizing people rather than saying, we're going to have this singular, really nice catered event for you versus putting that money in your pocket in the form of a stipend or a reward or an award. So you don't need to go and have these fancy, like we need your attention and to show we're important kind of events really intentionally use the resources and stuff that you have instead because the the mentors want to be mentors as Tara said earlier is they want to be there so we don't need to convince them that they want to be here because we gave them a nice meal and i would i would say you you don't yeah you you actually don't really want um like compensation for mentors or um, things that really push people into mentoring that don't really want to do it out of out of altruistic reasons. Um, that you want to be careful that the money that you spend doesn't uh, end up at cross purposes. You know that um, not only do we do we not need to pay mentors, um, I'd be a little bit worried about paying mentors. I think mine might be controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I said that we could live without in-person connection. I, I think it's wonderful to have in-person and that is what this program is and it has been successful. And when it started in 2015, we've all, we all know what happened since then. And so we all have a lot more familiarity with remote and virtual connections. And I think like we have Big Brothers Big Sisters runs a mentoring program locally connecting local, local folks with local high school students and that's virtual meetings. And I think we are, we've talked a lot about the national labs here in Albuquerque and how that fed our mentoring population. And I just don't want other universities to write off the opportunities of mentoring programs with STEM professionals because they don't have a similar local economy. Like you could run a similar program, but recruit virtual mentorship. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks and for you that. Don't, you don't, you oh. don't need uh, national labs either. <laughs> That's one thing that you don't need. It's great. I mean, there are employers uh, in, in any region uh, who are doing the kinds of work that students would love to do. Uh, ours just happens that that's one of our resources is the National Labs. And you could we look have at plenty like... of alumni who say, I'm not there anymore and I want to support the students. And so I've actually added a field on our interest forms that say, are you open to fully virtual interactions? And that way, both the mentors and the mentees can select into that relationship if being in person is not accessible. And I, th I think there's opportunities in any community, like we have the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, like there's just like other organizations that maybe isn't an employee resource group at a lab that you could tap into. And I think what I learned, what I learned is you bring in your, your core crew, your five to 10 first mentors, and then it was word of mouth from there. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because one of the things that I do hear from folks is often, where are we going to find mentors? And I think that uh, alumni uh, are great. Chambers are great. I think ERGs, uh, employee resource groups that we see um, within uh, large companies, right, where we have folks who are, are interested or passionate or doing extra. Uh, so I think those are really great call outs. And I am a huge proponent <laughs> of doing things virtually. Um, I was a little ahead of the game. And then, you know, the silver lining of the last three years sort of helped uh, us advance that. But it does, in terms of creating access and availability, uh, I think it does uh, really add value uh, to a mentoring relationship and mentoring programs. And so um, uh, thank you all for that. Yes, Can please. Add one more call out tomorrow before we go, just yeah. in, in response to you saying, how are we going to find these mentors? We've had a ton of luck on LinkedIn. So searching for companies or like local people, or even like I mentioned, I advise the Out in STEM organization. When you go on LinkedIn, you can like look up, let's say Out in STEM, and you can go see who all is affiliated. And we would just direct message people to be on panels, to be mentors, all of it. So LinkedIn is another great resource yeah. for finding mentors. That's fantastic. Well, I thank you so much for um, uh, the work that you have done um, at the university, for our state, for our students. Um, thank you for your uh, sharing your work in the chapter. And then of course, uh, following up today with your reflections and your wisdom and lessons learned. Uh, I'm excited for folks to, to read your case study. Um, and hear our conversation. And so uh, I'll leave any final words to, to you all before we close. 
No, I, I would just say this has been one of the most exciting programs that, that I've been a part of. And I think um, Tara and Yade are the reason that program succeeded. It, it, it was led by very conscientious, dedicated, open um, values and, and mission-driven staff. And that's that's key, um, you know, to have the people to build it, have those qualities uh, is just an amazing, amazing opportunity. And I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to share the program with a larger, broader audience. Yeah, I loved having this conversation with you all today. It was nice to get pulled back in to chat with Tim and Yade. Thanks for being such a wonderful host, Tamara. Thank you. Well, I think folks are going to learn a ton from your experience. And so uh, I'm I'm looking forward uh, to uh, the conversations and the programs that this inspires. So thank you all uh, for sharing here today. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>